Yes, got it. Perfect. All set? Yep, looks good. Okay, perfect. Sorry, guys, for the uh, little delay here. Um, okay, let me just minimize this. All right. Uh, first of all, thank you, Marty, for um, allowing me to speak today. Um, as you've noted, we've had the pleasure of being part of your uh, presentations and conferences uh, in the past. Uh, and I've, I've talked on the topics of the future of real estate, uh, which is something that I lecture on um, at Columbia and other places. Um, how timely is it to be speaking about industrial right now? I'll touch on some of the other real estate asset classes, um, but I have um, revised our, our normal presentation, uh, and today I'm going to talk about the impacts that, that we're seeing and, and kind of what we foresee on industrial real estate uh, in light of um, COVID-19. So um, the, the one thing which is really clear is what COVID-19 is doing is, is accelerating a change that was occurring before this crisis. Um, and, and it's sharpening now the, the, the need for e-commerce. E I mean, I, I don't know how many people are actually partaking right now, but I know in my house at least, um, we get deliveries four times a day of food I mean, we're stocked for three more years here, um, and, and they're coming from all sources that I never knew existed uh, besides Amazon Fresh and, and these other guys. So, uh, but this is not only occurring in families like myself, it's occurring with 80-year-olds. It's occurring, you know, with young kids. Uh, and, and kind of the belief here is now that people have gotten used to this, um, and, the, and the Peapod or Whole Foods icon is on uh, people's taskbars, uh, we're going to see a continued um, use of e-commerce post-COVID-19, uh, um, and and so uh, we're we're pretty we're pretty optimistic about the the pace of adoption of e-commerce. So this is going to continue to drive uh, industrial real estate over the next number of years. Uh, the other thing which is which is happening again, you're you know you're kind of waiting for your bananas uh, or whatever. So same day deliveries, next day deliveries are becoming kind of the expectation of, of people and you're gonna to continue to see that as being shaping uh, consumers' expectations. Um, out of, coming out of this, some of the some of this changes that we're gonna see are companies are gonna be moving towards what's called safety stock uh, versus what they used to have, which is uh, just in time inventories uh, and, you know, companies did not want to carry inventories uh, too much because it, it tied up cash, et cetera. Uh, now we're going to see companies actually holding more inventory. Uh, Prologis is projecting maybe 5 to 10% increase just in inventory levels uh, so that they don't run into issues again of, of being able to supply the population. The other thing which we're going to see more of is, is, is manufacturing coming back to the U.S., less dependence on, on foreign manufacturers again, tied to the fact people want to control their destiny. Uh, and I think that's going to, in turn, expedite uh, the integration of, of technology into um, and the operations of, of these businesses, not just automated vehicles, but also with inside the factories so that they're, they can be more competitive vis-a-vis -vis, um, um, manufacturing abroad. Uh, so this will have some in interesting implications for warehouse distribution, supply chains. Um, and, and interestingly, CBRE just came out with a, um, with a statement saying that they expect the um, rate of, of increase in uh, the annual growth rate of, of industrial to jump um, to 20% a year over the next five years versus 14%. You know, some, I don't know many real estate asset classes right now that can speak to that kind of growth rate. Um, and, and actually, today pronouncing that it's going to be even greater than they were, what they were thinking about before um, COVID-19, which in itself is a pretty remarkable uh, pace of growth. So what is this all going to mean for kind of the winners and losers? Um, obviously, as we talked about, online grocers are going to be major winners out of this, and that whole industry is in disarray and, and, and adaption. We're seeing wholesalers move into the direct-to-consumer business. Um, we're seeing, obviously, the, the, the grocery stores trying to figure out how to get the goods into people's hands. This is going to continue uh, after this crisis uh, starts abating. Uh, consumer product companies, healthcare companies are going to be thriving during this time. Obviously, Amazon, Target, Walmart, these kind of companies are going to continue to do very well. Amazon, as you know, it's been hitting its daily 52-week uh, highs um, and, and, and hiring like crazy. The same thing with uh, Target and Walmart. Uh, and there'll be others like them that'll emerge, which are going to start filling the void. 
uh, the, the major losers. Retailers, interestingly, retailers obviously were on the decline prior to this crisis. Um, in many ways, the crisis is providing cover for many of the retailers like Macy's who laid off effectively their whole force, workforce. Uh, I don't believe they're gonna be hiring back 50% of their workforce uh, post COVID. Uh, and, and they're doing so um, kind of in, in, in the storm. So they're not gonna get chastised for that. Uh, they're also gonna use this as an opportunity to renegotiate with their landlords. Um, and, and so you're gonna see a, a really, really dramatic shift uh, which again, uh, COVID-19 has um, accelerated to um, the shift in, um, in, in the way retail is going to present itself in the future. Malls are part of this story. Obviously, again, everyone knows that they've been on the decline. Also, this is going to continue that, that, that trend and they're gonna have to figure out a way to reinvent themselves. Uh, there are interesting opportunities, which we'll talk about briefly on what's gonna happen with malls uh, from a real estate opportunity. And then office buildings are gonna be kind of looked at you know, with Zoom and, and companies evaluating the, the necessary um, purposes of, of offices. Um, and, and then inside the offices themselves, as you may know, the trend used to be towards 250 square feet uh, per person, whereas a few years ago, it was say 500 square feet per person. Uh, that's going to be really looked at because of the uh, social distancing issues. So office is going to be affected dramatically by this. Uh, and um, it'll be very interesting to see how that recovers after the after we come out of this. So within the real estate um, in industrial sector, the, the, prop, the, the strategies that we're starting to think about, because we're, we're spending a lot of time right now evaluating what, what the opportunities are going to be uh, in the future. Uh, we are big believers in last mile, which we'll talk about. Last mile properties are properties located close to major population centers that enable retailers uh, to get their goods into consumers' hands the same day or, or within a few hours. Um, we're going to see more and more sale leasebacks, we believe, in the industrial space. We're actually working on a couple of those transactions right now as uh, companies look to get cash on their balance sheets. Uh, and this is going to be, this is going to happen pretty quickly. Um, obviously, we, we talked about the, the groceries, but thinking about where these goods are going to be stored, how they're going to be distributed. So refrigeration facilities, smaller ones close to cities are going to be, um, are going to become more and more important. And then ultimately bulk and, and uh, distribution. So large warehouses um, that will be uh, doing fulfillment and, and major distribution um, will also thrive. Again, it'll have to be in ma ne next to major populations. We're, we're less optimistic over the next 12 months about secondary tertiary locations for, for large box distributions. But surely in major markets around the country, this is going to be an area that's going to grow. Hey, Peter, before you leave that slide, can you just go back to it for one second? For one second. <laughs> so just real quick. Um, so we're talking about like um, office space, and I guess that WeWorks is a big player in that. Do you think that there's like WeWorks could become like a white label provider for office rentals, like short-term office rentals, or do you think there'll be like some vertical integration in that space for the well, office owners? Or Yeah, no, I actually was talking to someone this morning about this. Here's what's going to happen, in my opinion. I think the intermediaries like WeWork and, and some of the other guys, there's a, there's a firm in New York called Notel, I think these guys are gonna go bye-bye. And I think you're gonna find landlords are gonna be the ones who provide the service. Uh, there's no reason to be paying an intermediary for this. And so I think what's gonna happen with hotels, again, you know, it's gonna be major urban markets. I'm not sure if it happens in suburbia as much, uh, but you're gonna see these hotels almost moved towards like a hotel model where you're going to see monthly rentals. Uh, there'll still be the anchor um, tenants in these buildings, uh, but I do believe um, that the model that, that we were perfected and showed the world will survive here. Um, premise of it is, I think you're going to see less and less of a commitment to long-term leases, Marty, and I think, um, there could be some select guys that fit the void, but I really think landlords are going to say, well, I can do this myself. Why do I need these guys? So um, I think you're going to see some casualties uh, in, in the co-working space, but I think the premise of this is going to survive here. Great. Thanks a lot. Sure. So let me go back to where we were. Okay. But before this all, before COVID-19, 
mean, as, I, as I've spoken before in the past, industrial real estate is, was poised for significant growth. Um, as we mentioned, e-commerce has been growing uh, exponentially. Um, same day deliveries, as I mentioned before, are skyrocketing. Demand for warehouse space has been exploding. Uh, there's, I think, two or 300 million square feet projected in the next three years for demand um, uh, per CBRE. This number, I think, is going to go up. Uh, and, and interestingly enough, on the, on the last mile properties, the, the, one, of the, one of the phenomena that's going on is actually the, the supply of last mile properties is actually shrinking in areas like Philadelphia, around New York City, because they're becoming, those areas are becoming gentrified. And uh, up until recently, and even, even after this, uh, residential or other uses are more lucrative. So you're seeing this, an interesting phenomenon of, of increasing demand yet decreasing supply, which is going to, I think, continue to um, put pressure on, on pricing as far as rents and, and sales of these properties. Uh, and the other thing, just getting to uh, last mile, because it's a topic we're going to talk about a little bit more here, is they're, they're, hard, to, they're hard to bite into for institutions. They're smaller, they're environmentally challenged, uh, you know, they're, they're not cookie cutter like big boxes, uh, which, which makes the uh, playing field uh, for uh, competition different and, and, and less deep than some of the other asset classes. Um, Marty mentioned a little bit about us before, but I want to delve into this quickly. Warden Equity Partners um, has been around since 1987 when I formed it. Uh, and over the years, uh, the strategy of the firm is to always try to see what's coming next as far as secular trends. And I'll talk to you a bit about this later, but in 2017, really starting in 2016, we really started focusing on the, the movement of e-commerce and how it was going to affect uh, industrial real estate. And we, we made a full scale uh, effort to, uh, to get into the business. And since 2017, really early 2018, uh, we've been um, involved now in uh, the ownership and development of about three and a half million square feet, roughly $250 million worth of transactions uh, and, and we have major institutional partners as well as high net worth families um, who are our partners. Um, as I mentioned briefly, Wharton Equity has been around since 1987. We've been involved with over $2 billion worth of transactions across a wide array of asset classes. I think the common theme among them is, again, we're trying to be a little bit ahead of everyone else when we look at things. We don't want to be laid into a cycle um, investing where everyone else is investing. Uh, so. And, and our results have shown that we've been able to succeed in, in generating pretty attractive gross IRRs over the course of our career. And most importantly, and I'm knocking on wood here because anything could happen, but we haven't lost any equity on our real, real estate transactions. Um, and along the way, we've been fortunate to have uh, major institutional partners. Um, and, and obviously through all this, um, we've gained a lot of experience across many types of asset classes, some of which you can see on the screen here. Um, and we are the sponsor in these transactions. We're, we're not asset allocators. Getting back to the industrial space, again, we talked briefly about this, but we have um, a, a you know, real focus now, as I mentioned before in last mile. Um, again, it, we liked it before um, COVID-19. We're, we're, we're loving it even after. Um, and um, I have, I'm gonna give you a case study of a deal we just did, um, which highlights uh, what a last mile property is, um, and it involves a, a major e-commerce company. Um, and as I mentioned before, if, if, Peter, just, just to jump in one second here. So sure. by last mile, you don't actually mean like a mile away from Manhattan. You mean like some it's, kind of proximity. I mean, right. it's just, it's a term of art, you know, it's, it's understood. Really, you know, it's, I mean, um, Prologis calls it last touch. So it's, it's really the, it's the last outpost before people get their goods in their hands. Gotcha. Uh, okay. Right. And, and, um, there's many ways to distribute it, uh, but ultimately the, the goods have to reside in some kind of physical location. Uh, and, and whether they get into the cities via 18 wheelers or vans or bicycles is, is still being figured out by, by many. Um, we talked a little bit about the, the cell lease back, refrigeration. I don't want to, we don't have to go through this page in, in a lot of detail here, but um, these are the major areas that we're going to focus on. One of the interesting things to look at here with refrigeration just to get an idea of the numbers involved. Um, so they talked about a, um, the amount of online groceries was around $36 billion in 
2019, uh, and that's projected to get to $117 billion in 2023. So think about the volume that's going to be going through this supply chain to get into people's hands. This is a massive undertaking, uh, and it's going to have to change the way um, uh, grocery stores operate. And we're, we're, going, to, we're going to see things I call uh, ghost grocery stores, which have no retail inbound traffic. It's going to be strictly traffic um, going out for orders. So they'll be much more efficiently designed. Maybe 50,000 square foot could be 20,000 feet because you don't need big aisles and you know, big cashiers. Uh, so you're going to see less, less um, issues with, with the actual real estate itself, um, but they're going to be state-of-the-art facilities geared toward distribution. So lots of parking, uh, lots of truck uh, doors to get in and out. Um, and, and so this will be a pretty fascinating area uh, to look at. Right now is a really interesting time, I think, ahead of us um, with respect to industrial and, and real estate in general. First of all, a lot of investors are going to be preoccupied. The current um, investors like REITs and, and they, they have issues they have to deal with, with, with existing tenants. So they're going to be um, slow to react, I think, to new opportunities. Also, REIT stocks are getting crushed. 1031 investors that have historically been very active are going to be on the sidelines because they're not doing a lot of sales right now. So I think you're going to see a shifting of, of who the buyers are. Um, we feel pretty lucky in, in the regard that we have um, very little issues that we're dealing with right now. Uh, so we're going to be focused exclusively on all the new opportunities that are in front of us. Uh, but I can tell you that um, hotel guys, land, I mean, there's a lot of people out there right now who are going to be uh, licking their wounds for a while um, and not thinking about uh, future acquisitions. Um, I think what this is also going to result in is eventually sellers during the next 12 months, we'll say, six to 12 months, uh, sellers are going to be lowering their expectation. Brokers will be guiding them. Um, and so I think that you're going to see pricing drop. I don't think it's going to be through the floor on industrial because of the underpinnings, what we talked about earlier. But you're going to see some smushiness, if you will, during the next number of months, which will create some opportunities to buy some great assets. Uh, and once we get through this period of, let's say, 12 to 18 months, on the other side of this, and again, based on CBRE's projections, um, growth rates are going to be 20% a year. Uh, you're going to be very happy on the industrial real estate 24 months out. Um, and I, I am extremely confident, having done this for 30 plus years, that uh, the rents per square foot and the sales prices per square foot will exceed the highs that we achieved probably in January of this year uh, by, by a fair magnitude. Hey, hey, Peter, got a couple of questions from the outside. One, one is, what do you think about self-storage? Mm -hmm. Which, I, you know, I, we have always liked self-storage. Um, you know, how, I don't know how it's handling the crisis right now. And then also, you know, what about Amazon-resistant businesses such as floor and decor and things like that? So any thoughts? Self-storage is a fascinating business. We love it. We, we've been active in it uh, for years. Um, I think it's going to do very well. The, one of the questions I have to think about right now, though, and it's, it's fascinating because I, I, you know, I pick up these little tidbits from people I talk to. I mean, that's one of the things we do as a business is we're talking all the time to everybody. Um, but during this crisis, people are sitting there, they have more time on their hands, and they're actually looking at the credit card bills, and they're saying, do I need to spend $100 a month for, for the couch I've had sitting for 20 years in self-storage? And so you're seeing actually kind of right now people taking the effort to go and clip go in there and take your stuff out and get rid of it. Um, so I think you're going to see self-storage does well in transition. So what's going to happen out of this, I believe, is uh, you're going to see people shrinking down in, into smaller apartments. Uh, there's going to be movements around that. People are going to, businesses are going to close. Uh, they're going to need a place to store their goods. So I think self-storage does very well um, in, in the years ahead. I really like self-storage. Big problem with self-storage historically is it's very easy to build. So supply from an investor standpoint has always been the nemesis of self-storage. Um, as an investor, if you can find kind of infill locations that have great barriers to entry, um, and I'm, I'm a major fan of self-storage and it's an area that we're looking at very hard. And by the way, self-storage is an interesting play also close to the cities because I think you're going to see some of these facilities become more last mile facilities where, where full floors may actually um, instead of having, uh, you know, the 10 by 10 lockers, they may be gutted and, and leased to Amazon uh, for deliveries into the city. So 
there's lots of ways I think self-storage wins in the future. Uh, and it's a place that I like a lot. Um, Marty, the other question was about, I wasn't clear what you were asking. The other question was about like uh, Amazon resistant businesses. So businesses that Amazon can't really poach. Is that what you're talking about? Yeah, like you know, like uh, floor and decor businesses, things like that, you know, uh, rugs, etc. cetera. It's a, that's a very interesting question. I don't know if there's going to be many businesses that Amazon is not going to be able to conquer in the, in the years ahead. The amount of real estate, and, and we're very close to Amazon. Um, we'll talk more about that in a few minutes. But, but, the, but the mindset there is there's nothing that's off limits to them. Uh, you're seeing a company like Wayfair, which kind of falls into that quasi category of maybe being a little immune to Amazon, getting completely destroyed during the cycle. Now, their business model has been questionable anyhow. Uh, they were never making money, um, you know, but their stock's gotten completely destroyed. Uh, I, I don't know, Marty, if, if I see those businesses um, avoiding Amazon, but, but what I do see is I see companies like Home Depot and, and some of the other guys who um, may be... Um, stronger coming out of this and thinking about, I think they're the greatest threats to Amazon. Um, I, I don't know if I see some of the smaller retailers surviving any of this over the long term. I just don't, windows to go, whatever they are. I, I just think all these guys are gonna get pulverized. I'm not sure how many actually make it through this recession. Um, and uh, so, um, I, again, I don't know if I answered the question, but I'm not, I don't know, I don't know if we're gonna see in three or four or five years from now, unless the government steps in. Amazon not being involved in everything, uh, which is a scary prospect in some regard. So, yep, move on. Um, so anyway, from our standpoint, we again just to kind of finish our thought, we think this is going to be an interesting time to to buy the real estate we wanted to buy pre-COVID uh, and then own it for for a long period of time. So we're going to be focusing more on income, good quality real estate next to major highways, major cities, and uh, and, and really try to enjoy the benefits, we think, of, of, of the demand uh, that's going to occur in the years ahead. You, you can't look as an investor in what's happening in this moment in time. Uh, you have to be thinking about what's two, three, four, five years look like from now uh, to really make money. And, and the great money, if you look historically in, in real estate, was coming out of these downturns and having the foresight and the capital and the experience to buy the assets but, but capitalize them properly. So longer time to lease, uh, more money towards CapEx, uh, you know, lower expectation on rents. These are the kind of factors that we're gonna be putting into our models. Uh, and and in, when we find those, those opportunities that, that satisfy all these requirements and, and it's good real estate, we're gonna go aggressively and buy this. Because I, again, I go back to the same fact, I have no doubt in my mind that industrial real estate is going to be the darling of all the real estate asset classes as we look over the next three to five years. So Peter, uh, talking about industrial real estate, uh, I guess that, you know, cannabis has been pretty big and it was noted as a crucial business in California recently. So any thoughts on the, you know, the storage and retail of cannabis or um, that, that came from the audience as well. Cannabis is a, is a frightening, it's, it's a little bit of a frightening field for us, and not because of the nature of what it is, but you know, when, whenever people kind of pile into something, what they're doing, uh, there's a lot of, lot of uh, guys who are not gonna make it. Um, that's not, it's not just the companies themselves, it's, 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 a, it's everyone else who's trying to get in there. So there are a bunch of warehouse guys who have been playing in the space. They're having a tough time finding credit worthy companies. Obviously, there's issues with banking as far as not being able to take credit cards. Uh, so I, I think it's a very niche business long, long term. There's, I think I, if I were to go into that business, I'd be going only with the quality vendors and, and really, in, again, high barrier entry markets. Um, I think states like California, some of the bigger states, um, I think are going to do well. Uh, it's just not an area that we are really interested in because there's there's too many other opportunities. And, and for us, at least, you know, we'd rather own industrial that has a broad array of potential users uh, versus, let's say, cannabis, which is, which is somewhat uh, specific, although those buildings can be adapted. Um, but I, I, again, I, I would be very careful about, as a general rule, kind of just saying, oh, we're going to own warehouses or we're going to own retail around cannabis. Uh, the world's still trying to figure out 
what the, the long-term implications are, are, are going to be of this business. Yeah, we, we have a bunch of uh, cannabis lenders who have presented in the past. I have to do a deep dive with them and see how things have come out with all of this, I'm sure. It'll be, it'll be interesting know. to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So why don't you move on and keep on going? It's funny that they call it essential. I mean, I, again, I, you know, the same thing with alcohol. I mean, you know, what's essential mean these days? I don't know anymore. But um, so as I talked about before with, with, uh, with the firm, and, and again, you asked me before about last mile. Um, so technically, generally speaking, for us at least, we're looking for, we're looking for population. So Boston down to D.C., pockets of some markets in the southeast like Nashville and Atlanta, uh, and then we love Orlando and Miami uh, as, as a general rule, the East Coast. Uh, and, and for us as a firm right now, we're, we're looking for the smaller buildings um, that, are, that are kind of, as I mentioned, closer to population. It's very hard to find really big buildings because of the scarcity of land and the way these things are built. Uh, and um, when, many times what we do here is when we go in to find these properties, because they're older, there's a lot of capex required. And again, as I mentioned, Historically, these properties have been located in areas that have been industrial. So there's, there's environmental issues and other concerns uh, which you have to deal with, uh, which I think creates actually some value of, you know, from, a, from a barrier to entry uh, situation for investors. But just kind of just for people who are not familiar with this, um, to the building on the left is, it would be kind of deemed to be more of an infill um, last mile, the other property is probably, let's say, an hour and a half outside of the city or, or the location. Again, probably serviceable into the city or, or in fact, servicing the last mile facility. And then you have the big regional uh, distribution uh, centers located uh, generally, let's say, three or four hours, maybe more outside of the major cities. Lehigh Valley, for example, which is out in central uh, Pennsylvania, uh, is a major um, place for these distribution facilities. Uh, and, and they are, um, one of the reasons they're out there is because they can distribute to about a third of the, of the U.S. population from there. So they'll go, and then also it's easily accessible to the, the Port of Newark, uh, and then up to Canada and, and other areas. So, so these are dealing with obviously large quantities of goods. Uh, and then many of these are, are actually direct to consumers, so fulfillment centers. Uh, so you're seeing people work there who you know, the goods are, are distributed right to the consumer from there. Just kind of for us, again, talking about our strategy, East Coast, some of the major cities in the Southeast, and then, and then Florida. We think these, these markets are going to continue to thrive. Uh, but I don't think anyone's immune here. Um, you're going to see cities like Akron, Ohio. Um, you know, they're going, to, they're going to need last mile facilities. I mean, it's a smaller place. But even if you start looking at it, Google, um, Amazon is going everywhere. They're... They just bought a bunch of malls in Ohio, which they're retrofitting or tearing down to make major distribution centers. Ultimately, uh, I, I believe that you're going to see all over the country, and it's going to take a while for this to get built out, but the entire population will be able to get goods within the same day. And uh, we're kind of, I, I, I do the analogy, I mean, the analogy of, of when the highways were put in and the interstates went first, and then the off ramps, and, and then kind of the side roads. And, so we're, we're really just put all the, the, all the major highways in place. And, and now we're going to start seeing the, the off-ramp off, off ramp and, and the roads coming out of there. Uh, and so as an investor, you, you want to start thinking about, well, what are the, where are those places leading to? Uh, so there's a strategy, not right now, because there's still a lot of good things to buy uh, in, in the bigger markets. But over time, as, 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 the, as, the, as this infrastructure gets built out, there's going to be some really interesting opportunities in some of these smaller cities. And Peter, can I just make one aside? You know, as somebody who grew up in the 70s, you know, same day delivery online is like magic, <laughs> right? It is magic, right? It really I mean, it's is. a curse too, Marty, let's be realistic. I mean, I, you know, I, I mean, I'm stepping over packages in my house. I need another house just for the goods, um, you know, but it's, but, you know, and, and sometimes I think people probably have the same thing. You, you, you get something, you forget what it was that you ordered, you know, it comes the next day and, but, um, but it is a pretty incredible, it's really an amazing change to our life when, when you think about it. And, and how, how incredible is it? Think about the world that we're in. If we didn't have this capacity and we have the disease and what we're doing right now, what are people, what would they do? They'd be going to stores physically and, and having to do it because there's no other way to do it. So, which would probably exacerbate the situation with respect to the spread of the virus. Um, so, 
this whole this whole situation is is really pretty um, uh, really interesting because if this had occurred 20 years ago, we'd have we'd be in a different place right now potentially with our recovery. Um, and uh, so, Peter, Peter, I, I got a couple of questions, so uh, and they kind of all fit into the same bucket. Sure. So I thought you might be able to answer them. So you know, because it's family offices, a lot of family offices are moving out of the Northeast area to low tax states like Florida and uh, Texas. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you know, what are your thoughts on the outflow of population from high density areas, and how's it going to impact you know A, B, and C markets? And then just in general, you know, how do you think Florida is going to be impacted by all of these people you know migrating over to? Uh, uh, so <laughs> you absolutely have to love Florida. You know, the migration was starting beforehand. Um, some of it because of tax reasons um, with the new tax laws that occurred. Um, but the quality of life, uh, yeah, I, think, I think this event is going to make people reflect. They have a lot of time to reflect on their lifestyle. And I think that this is going to continue to push people down to Florida. Uh, we love Central Florida as a, as a market. Miami is obviously incredible. But I don't think there's anywhere in the state that is not going to do really well uh, in the future. So um, Florida is fantastic. Texas is a great state, too. Great cities there. Uh, you know, I think there's being less and less dependence. Houston still has a kind of a little bit of too much dependence on oil. Uh, Dallas is much more diversified now. But even some of the other cities are, uh, Austin is incredible, one of the great cities in the country. So uh, I think, Marty, from this, and let me, let me explain something else. I think with Zoom and, and what's happening with that, people are realizing more and more so that they could be sitting in Austin, Texas, uh, uh, overlooking a lake uh, and, and, and collaborating with, uh, with their other employees or you know, partners. Uh, so I think there's going to be more acceptance of that. Uh, and so I think that continues to further uh, people's decisions to actually you know, live in places they want to live in and not be as concerned as they used to be about the need to be somewhere um, you know, for, for employment reasons. Uh, so we are, again, just to kind of recap it, I am a major bull, um, uh, particularly on Florida, because that's a market we know well. We have, we have some uh, major residential projects down there, which, which we're going through final approvals on. Uh, and um, you know, we're gonna go full steam ahead as soon as the world opens up to build us. Because I Peter, you got about 10 minutes left, but if, if you have time to discuss uh, public equities in the real, like REITs and uh, ETFs and things like that, that'd be great because there's a couple of uh, public equities investors here are looking for some guidance on that as well. Look, I, I don't understand the stock market right now. I don't understand why it's going up. I think we're in for a lot of long-term issues um, over the next nine months, in my opinion. It's just, you just can't stop the economy one day, all total, and then assume that the world's going to be, um, you know, prosperous. Uh, you know, I, it, we're not, I, in my opinion, again, I'm not a stock analyst, and, but based upon what we're hearing and talking to people, really, the lights will start becoming brighter in 21. I think this year is going to be digging out of this. Uh, so as far as my opinion on stocks, I, I don't love the REIT sector. Uh, right now, I, I think they're, they're, they're going to have problems buying new stock, buying new properties. I think that they're going to be, they're exposed, particularly, obviously, hotel REITs and others are exposed, ETFs, depending upon what they are. I do like public storage. I mean, I do like the storage REITs. Um, I love the, I think Prologis is an interesting play, some of the, some of the um, industrial REITs. Uh, I, don't know how you, I don't know how you invest in a hotel REIT. I don't know how you invest in an office REIT right now. So... I think it's very specific, Marty, to the, the asset class, uh, but I'd be, I'd be leery of it. You know, I, I'll just tell a quick story and then I, I want to get to something else here in my presentation, but we had some friends of ours who we were, we were raising some money for a fund and one of the guys said to me, well, I, I could have invested, this was uh, six months ago, I can get a 40% return if I invested in this ETF, which was a, let's say a real estate ETF. Well, that ETF is down 40%, right? And, I, and one of the things you have to realize as an investor, I understand the value, of having liquidity, I, I get it with, with respect to real estate, but the real estate itself is generally not, is not susceptible to the vagaries of the stock market, which is what we're seeing right now. So I like real estate as a tangible asset that you hold and own over time and it grows. It's, it's, not, it's not subject to conditions that, that are beyond your control, generally speaking, obviously economic downturns, et cetera. But um, you know, the price of oil shouldn't, if the market goes down, even, even the REITs go down that day. 
Um, and, and so you have to have the stomach for, for that kind of volatility if, you, if you're going to be in the stock market. And I, I just think in this time, particularly with, with the opportunities I see ahead, I, I kind of like tangible assets um, that are private over the public markets. It's just an opinion. Um, I wanted to just jump on quickly because this is an important case study um, and then I'll, I'll toss, take some questions at the end. So I talked about early on um, uh, last mile and some other things. It, this is a really fascinating situation that just occurred and so it's timely for us to talk about it. Within the last two and a half weeks, give or take, we, ha we have signed 900,000 square feet of leases during this crisis uh, with a major e-commerce company. I have to keep it confidential right now. Um, and uh, two of our properties that we own. One property on, on the left is a last mile facility in Philadelphia, and the other one on the right is a, a bulk distribution property that we are developing and almost done with in um, Ocala, which is central Florida. The, the property on the left is a really fascinating case study because when we acquired this property in July of last year, this was a rundown, this de decrepit kind of um, subway repair facilities. You can actually see in the, in the building here, those were subway doors, doors for the, car, for the cars to go in. So there were rails going through this building. Um, everything was leaked, the roofs were leaking. But what we loved about this property is you can see Philadelphia in the background there. It's, it's in with, within minutes, let's say 15 minutes of two to three million people, in about an hour, six million people, plus I-95, which is on the left, um, the port, the airport. Um, so we went ahead and acquired this property and put eight to $10 million into it. Uh, and in the last two weeks, we signed the whole building to a, a 10 year lease with a major e-commerce company. Uh, and from this property, they are using, they're doing same day deliveries. Uh, and and one, of the, one of the things they also liked about this particular property is the amount of parking that's available. Uh, you can't fully see it here. Uh, but there's around the property itself, there's an enormous amount of, of parking, which is unusual for an urban setting. The, the property on the right is a 617,000 bulk warehouse. Um, uh, again, this is in Ocala, Florida, uh, which is uh, kind of on the way from Orlando down to Tampa. It's on I-75, which is a north-south highway that runs down from Atlanta. Uh, so you're, you're meeting a confluence of what's, what's I-4, which is connected Orlando to Tampa, and 75 which is, a, you know, runs down, as I said, from Atlanta. That whole area is, is a booming area for, for distribution. You get down to the, uh, the south of the state, uh, obviously the east side, the west side of the state, also into markets into uh, South Carolina, um, Savannah. Uh, you hit a lot of places from this area. Um, when we bought this piece of land um, about a year and change ago, uh, Ocala was, was a secondary location for, for distribution. But what we loved about it was there was a lot of labor. One of the big issues today, as you can imagine, is labor is, is short in many of these markets where a lot of these big buildings are. I mean, you could have 2,500 people working in a facility. If you're next to a town of 3,000 people, 5,000 people, you're not going to have enough labor. Uh, so Ocala has a plentiful amount of labor. Uh, and, and so we took a bet there. You can kind of see 75, I-75, it's, it's behind the building. But... Um, anyway, um, again, about a week and a half ago, we signed the, the entire building to uh, an e-commerce company. And, and I point hey, this hey, out. Peter, how, how close is that to like University of Central Florida, University of Florida? I mean, they're all oh, on I-75, you know, there's like 200. Hour, hour and a half. Nice. Uh, you know, Orlando is within an hour and a half. Um, it's, it's, it's really fantastic. And, and again, I continue to emphasize, I think Central Florida is, is one of the great growth places in the country. Orlando is fantastic. It's not just Disneyland. It's, it's, a, it's a deep, diverse uh, economy and, 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 and great lifestyle. Um, it's one of the bright cities. I think Nashville falls in that bucket, but I like Orlando even better. Uh, and and I, we like Austin, we like Denver, um, we like Atlanta, These, you know, we like Charlotte, we like Raleigh. These are cities that can continue to uh, flourish um, as we move forward. Uh, so um, anyway, so these, these are interesting studies, and again, I don't want to be redundant here, but this occurred in the middle of this crisis. Many, many guys who were, who were leasing had taken the foot off the gas and said, talk to me in July, talk to me in August. You know, I know we were talking about leasing in your building, but uh, to the contrary, we're seeing a, a massive push. And, and the, Amazon is doing more sales now than they do at Christmas time. Uh, they were up until recently. That may have debated a little, but... Um, you know, so, so 
this is a phenomenon that is, is really unique, um, you know, to, to the overall world of, that we're living right now. Well, Peter, getting back to the theme of time compression, mm -hmm. you know, you, Amazon is doing more business than Christmas, but a lot of these retailers, if they want to do any kind of business, have to be ready by Christmas time, right? I mean, that's going to be an interesting problem, Marty. Think about that, right? Manufacturing has stopped. China has stopped. They're now slowly gearing up. So, and here's the other problem you have. You have apparel manufacturers sitting with winter goods still. They would have gotten rid of this already. There, there's a whole, this, this, the ramifications of what's happening with this event are so deep. Everything is, is, is being affected by it. And, and so how is, how is um, uh, you know, Phyllis Van Usen, who has Tommy Hilf Hilfiger and, and Calvin Klein, how are they going to get rid of their inventory? TJ Maxx doesn't have the room for it. So, so you're going to have, you have an issue of A, the old inventory, right? And then B, how, how do you get the goods, new goods into the United States um, if they're being made in China when China's closed down? So I think Christmas is going to be a, a, be a fascinating time here. I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of sales and it's going to occur much earlier so that they, they can clear the system out. The question is, are the consumers going to be there to buy it, right? Because, uh, you know, a big part of our population is out of work. And, and I, don't know how much, I don't know how much spending they're going to do on buying another hat um, if they don't need it. So this is, why I, uh, this is why I'm a little concerned about over-enthusiasm about our economy right now. I think we'll clear through this, but it's going to take some time. And, and, and I think it's much deeper and wider um, that the, you know, than the government is actually um, per, portraying right now, and even the stock market. Um, so, Peter, we, we have about one more minute to go for your presentation, but you know, I wanted to congratulate you for getting uh, pre-COVID pricing on uh, COVID deal. Uh, so that's pretty remarkable. Thank you. Uh, I want, Marty, I have on the screen, I'll just do it really fast here. We are okay. in the process right now of putting some money together, um, and, and we can talk about this offline if some people are interested, um, you know, based upon the, the, the strategy that, we, uh, that I enunciated here. And, and the timing of this is so perfect. Um, we, were, we were actually engaged in, um, in having this uh, vehicle put together prior to COVID. Now I'm expediting this. Uh, so sometime in June, we're gonna be closing on our first tranche of this. Um, and if anyone's interested, um, you know, please contact Marty or me um, about this. Also one of my partners is um, handling fundraising for this. Uh, we're going to make all the presentations available. So, Peter, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Okay. Cheers. So I need to I need to get rid of this, Marty. Do I need to? Absolutely. Okay. Yes. Great. Thanks. Okay, guys. So, uh, you know, Peter gave a fantastic presentation, and uh, we'll make it available to everybody who requests it. Uh, we're going to go on to Carol Pepper now. Before Carol starts, I, you know, we want to talk about uh, this big movement in the family office space. Obviously, a lot of them are moving. Uh, out of the Northeast to places like Florida, but also there's a big movement in uh, virtual family offices and uh, using uh, outsourced CIOs uh, who are subject matter experts on different topics. Uh, so I'm gonna ask Carol to get started. Carol, did you wanna introduce yourself briefly? Cause I, you have a fantastic background. And by the way, it's uh, Carol's birthday as well. So Carol, <laughs> are you there? Carol, you've been chatting with me all this time. Hi, Peter. Sorry, can everybody see me? And can you hear me? I, uh, I don't see you, see but I can hear you. you oh, there you are. Perfect. Can you see me? And can you see my presentation? Yes. Okay, great. Well, it, hello, everybody. And uh, today is my birthday. I'm happy to share it with everybody. And you'll see behind me balloons and really cute decorations. I woke up to this surprise from my husband and my daughter, so... I get to share it with you guys today. I'm very excited. I'm very blessed with a great family, wonderful friends. A lot of them are on this 